So my message today, the title is the shortest I've ever had for any title. It's a single word, woe. The word woe is an interjection, woe. Uh, it means uh, something like uh, despair, ruin, or uh, doom. Woe. Something has happened. Woe. Guys know the feeling of this, this word, woe. You know, it's when your, your, your spouse in bed says to you, hey, do you know what today is? Well, you know, uh, you spent the whole day, and yeah, you've been busy all day, and he said, well, uh, no, what, what, what's today? You know, you're about to retire for the night. And, and she simply says, it was our anniversary. <laughs> Whoa, you know that feeling of ruin, of uh, that despair, of doom? <laughs> well, it goes the same way for the gals. You're driving along in a car behind you, all of a sudden puts on a siren and the flashing lights go on. And uh, you know that uh, you're the only one on the road, and uh, so you pull over, and he pulls in right behind you, and you have that deep, sinking feeling inside of, whoa, <laughs> what did I do wrong, right? Whoa, whoa. Whoa is going to be used two times in our passage, I think, for four different points. Isaiah the prophet knew about woe. In the sixth chapter of uh, the book of Isaiah, Isaiah tells us that it was in the year that Uzziah died. We know that was around uh, 640 uh, B.C. Uh, King Uzziah died. In the year that King Uzziah died, he said, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. His train of his garment filled the whole temple. That was an unusual Lord's Day. He goes into the house of the Lord, and he has this vision of the Lord, high and lifted up. Now, I know from the New Testament that he actually saw Jesus Christ before he was incarnate, the pre-incarnate living word of God, sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, this robe, this train, while he's on his throne, just comes down and fills the temple. He's engulfed in the presence of Jesus Christ in his pre-incarnate glory. Whoa. See how I said that word? Whoa. He also saw two seraphim. Now, seraphim is an angel, and the word seraph means to burn. They're the burning ones, and so... If I were a Hollywood producer, I'd do this in high-tech technology. I would show them as flaming sparks flying off of these angels. They have six wings each. Two of them, they cover their face. Two of them, they cover their feet. And with two of them, they're just flapping and they're flying. Awesome sight. I'm sure he thought, whoa. <laughs> they begin to speak. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is full of his glory. And I think they're chanting back and forth to each other, holy, holy, holy. Now the word holy, the word holy means to be set apart from sin. Having heard this, having seen this, Isaiah says, here it is, Woe is me. <laughs> the next line is translated differently in different uh, translations. Woe is me, for I am undone, King James Version. I'm undone. I dwell among, uh, I, I, I'm a man with unclean lips, and I dwell among an unclean people. I am undone. Some translations have, I am ruined. I'm ruined. I like the New Living Translation. It says, I am doomed. <laughs> Why? I'm a man of unclean lips. Jesus teaches that from our lips comes what's in our heart. And if my lips are unclean, my heart is unclean, I'm a wicked man standing before this almighty, glorious, heavenly, holy, holy, holy God. And I'm doomed. At that point, one of the seraphs takes the tongs from the altar, reaches, and gets a burning coal, one that has been on the altar 
the burnt altar where they had placed animal sacrifices whose blood dripped down kind of like when you cook a steak down on the coals. So the blood-soaked coals are taken from the altar and he flies and he takes and he purges Isaiah's lips and he removes his sin and cleans him with the blood-stained judgment fires coal of, of the altar and he purges his lips. Whoa. Whoa. He says, whoa. Isaiah knew, woe is me, for I am a man who is doomed when I stand before an almighty, holy God. We should feel the same way when we come into the presence of the Lord. Woe is me. Thank God for the blood-stained blood of Jesus Christ on the cross so that when we believe in him, his blood, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses us from all sin. In the book of Amos, he's going to talk about woe too. He's got a couple of them in the text. And the first one is woe to the ignorant. Now, most of us think somebody else is ignorant, but not me, right? (laughs) Woe to the ignorant. But he's going to talk about woe to the ignorant It says, woe here, he says, woe in verse 18 of chapter 5. We're going to cover 5 and 6 today. He says, woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. You see, they had this idea. That the Bible talks about a coming time, the day of the Lord, when there's going to be some difficulty, and then there's going to be this period of prosperity. And then God's going to keep us from the, the, the difficulty and just bring us the prosperity so we can live any way we want. It doesn't matter. He says, woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Verse 18. Verse 20, he says, will not the day of the Lord. See, he's talking about the day of the Lord. So the question is, what is this thing called the day of the Lord? Now, it is different from the Lord's day. The Lord's Day is Sunday, and we meet together on the Lord's Day. But the Day of the Lord is mentioned throughout the Old Testament. Listen to what he says. Why do you long for the Day of the Lord? That day will be a day of darkness, not light. The Day of the Lord is a time period, both of darkness and light. It is the tribulation period that is coming and then the kingdom age that follows. The tribulation period, if you've been in the Bible studies on the end times that we've had here, you know that is a seven-year period that is coming, according to Daniel. It's going to come and it's going to be a time of trouble and difficulty. It's going to be a terrible, terrible, terrible time. But then Jesus Christ returns at the end of that period and sets up a kingdom that is a time of prosperity and blessing. And he's saying to this audience, he's saying, listen, it's not going to be just a wonderful time. He says, it's going to be as though a man fled from a lion. You're getting away from a lion only to meet a bear. (laughs) Prospect is not very good, is it? He said, no then, but you get away from the bear and it's as if the, oh, you enter into the house and you rest on the wall. <sighs> Only, he says, to have a snake bite you. <laughs> we have an expression for all of this. It's called out of the fire pan and into the fire. You go from worst to the worst. From worst to the worst. He's saying, that's the way this period is going to be. It's going to be every day it gets worse and it gets worse and it gets worse for a total of seven years. It's going to be that way. He says, so why are you longing for this day? You see, they are ignorant of Bible prophecy. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light? Pitch dark without a ray of brightness. Isaiah had said this. Well, for the day of the Lord is near. It will be a It will come like destruction from the Almighty. It's going to be a terrible time. He says in another place, see, the day of the Lord is coming, a cruel day with wrath and fierce anger to make the land desolate and to destroy sinners within it. Whoa, this is a dreadful day. 
He goes on in, the, in Jeremiah the prophet says this, how awful that day will be. None will be like it. It will be a time of trouble for Jacob, but he will be saved out of it. It's going to be the most difficult time of your life. Then Jeremiah adds this, but that day belongs to the Lord, the Lord Almighty, a day of vengeance for vengeance on his foes. It's going to be a terrible, terrible time. For the day of the Lord is near, says Ezekiel. The day of the Lord is near, a day of clouds, a time of doom, a time for the, a doom for the nations. God has got a period of time coming where he's going to set everything right. Wickedness will be judged here on the earth. Joel, the prophet, says, Alas, that day, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. Listen, I don't want to be there for this day, do you? It was a terrible day. Joel says, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand. It's a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, such as never was of old nor ever will be uh, in ages to come. Whoa. He says it's close at hand. What he's saying is it's impending. It could happen at any time. You know, and Peter, he says, a day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a, is a day. So when he says close at hand, he's not talking about our time schedule. He's talking about God's time schedule. This day is coming. Zephaniah, a little tiny book of the Old Testament, says this, the great day of the Lord is near, near and coming quickly. Listen, the cry on the day of the Lord will be bitter shouting of the warrior there. You get to picture this as a dreadful, terrible time that is yet in the future to come. This brings me to the New Testament. It, it hadn't come by the time of the Apostle Paul, for the Apostle Paul says, after the rapture, where he talks about in 1 Thessalonians 4, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The next chapter, very next verse after that, it says this. Two, two verses later. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. What? The day of the Lord is darkness. And the Lord, this day is going to come like a thief in the night. How does a thief in the night come? It's impending. It could happen at any time. But he doesn't announce that he's coming. I had a robber come to my house one day. I wasn't there. I'd slipped out of the house to get some uh, uh, dinner. We, are, we were renovating the house. So I got to tell you the story. The kitchen is totally gone. We're moving our staircase, so the staircase is totally gone. You can't get to the basement without a ladder. We're still living on the other side of the state. And so all I brought over was all of our junk. You know what I'm talking about? Because I wanted to stage the house over there to look really nice. So if it was junk, and it's all in boxes, stuck in the basement, you got a ladder to get down to it. The house is a wreck. I'm over at the house doing a little stuff, and I got, I got a TV tray table with a little tiny TV on it plugged in so I could at least watch the news and things. And uh, so I, I got hungry, so I jumped out of the car and went out over to the Taco Bell and I come back, and I said, oh, my goodness, I can't believe I left the front door open. And so I go into the house, and I sit down, unwrap my Taco Bell, and I look in the door frame all around the door that I came in that I thought I left open was all busted loose. So somebody came, and they kicked in our door. And I thought for a second, and I said, there's, there's a robber. And I looked around, and I said, boy, that poor guy, he came in this house expecting to get something. He couldn't take a kitchen. He couldn't take, there was nothing there, nothing. He came when I didn't expect it. And after he had come, then I still didn't notice it until I saw the door frame all busted. And so I called the police, and the police then arrived. And then they scolded me for not calling them immediately and first going through the house to see if anything was missing. What if he had been in the house? Should have called us first, got out of the house? Anyway, a few weeks later, they caught this guy. But of course, at my house... He didn't get anything, so I didn't get anything back. But when does a robber come? When does a thief come? When you least expect it. 
The day of the Lord comes when you least expect it. But he says, listen, in verse 4, this terrible, dreadful time that comes suddenly. Verse 3 in between, it says, but when they're saying peace and safety, then comes sudden destruction. The fourth verse says, but you brothers are not in darkness. What? If you are a Christian, you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are not in darkness. So that this day should surprise you as a thief. Why? Because the rapture has taken place. You're gone. You're gone because you know Jesus. And then this terrible, dreadful seven-year period of the day of the Lord begins. But you're not here for it because you're a child not of the darkness, but you're a child of the light. Amen? Amen. You are the sons of the light, the next verse says. Sons of the day. What's the day? That's the kingdom to come. So that when the Lord takes us to heaven, we're not here for the darkness, but he said, you're the, day, you're the children of the daytime, the light. You will return with Christ so that when he reigns for a thousand years on the earth, according to the revelation, you, he's going to reign for a thousand years. You will be here with him. You miss the darkness when you know Jesus Christ is your Savior. That's such good news. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, all that doom, all that despair, all that woe, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah for that. Amen. You see, instead of saying woe, I say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Instead of saying, whoa, I say, praise the Lord. Instead of that, I say, whoa, doom and despair, salvation, glory and honor. Oh, man, that's so different. Being a Christian makes all the difference in the world. He says, woe to the ignorant because they don't know their prophecy. He says, woe to the ignorant because you have an ignorant worship. He says, I hate, I despise your religious feast, I cannot stand your assemblies. You gather together and you worship. It's all ritual. Your heart is so far from me. It's not about liturgy. It's not about songs. It's not about memorized prayers. It's about where is your heart? Are you, are, have you given me your heart? Their heart was so far from them. He said, you are so ignorant on worship. He says, you're ignorant on offerings. Even though you bring me burnt offerings, most of you don't burn your dollar bills before you put them in the offering plate. We still give our offerings. That's a part of our worship. So at the end of the service, when we have the offering plates at the door and you go out and you think, oh man, I'm getting lunch. I'm on my way out of here. Probably the most worshipful thing you may have done in the day is put your gift in there to the Lord. If your heart is right. You think God really needs your money? Come on. You and I both know God doesn't need our money. There's a song we used to sing. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth in every mine. An American seminary was struggling at some time, and one of the great famous preachers was there in chapel and understood that seminary was on financial crisis. He simply prayed, Lord, you own the cattle on a thousand hills. It was in Texas. And so he said, Lord, have some of those cattle farmers sell them and send the money to the seminary. The money started flowing in. God doesn't need our money. He owns everything. So giving your money is like not, not doing some big favor for God. He's already did the favor for you. He's graced you, given you the money so that you can give a tenth back to him to say, thank you, God, in gratitude for all that you've blessed me. He said, even though you bring me your burnt offering, you're bringing their animal offerings, and your grain offering, they're bringing the, the grain offerings. And, and he says, and I, I do not, I will not, will not accept them. Though you bring me the choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Why? Because their hearts were so far from God. When your heart is in your gift, it means everything to God. But when it's strictly obligation and you're trying to leverage them, you know, like Jacob. Remember Jacob said, Lord, if you'll bless me, I'll give you a tenth. 
He's bargaining with God. I'm going to use this as a bargaining ship. See, Lord, if I, if I give you a tenth, how about helping me win the lotto? Only we don't usually do it that way, but pretty close. When you do that, he says, I loathe it. I despise it. I despise it. They were ignorant about their singing. Away with the noise of your song. I will not listen to the music on your harp. So listen, I, I don't care how wonderful a performance you may give. If it's not coming from your heart, it's not worship. And I don't receive it. Wow. Ignorant in their injustices. But let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like an ever, a never failing stream. Just do what is right. When you do what is right, you are doing what is just. You are acting righteous. But when you don't, and you know in your heart what I am doing, it can be as simple as you telling somebody, phone call comes in and you didn't want it, and you say, tell them I'm not here. Ooh, that's wrong. That's unrighteous. Prejudice. Prejudice against somebody for their gender, their race, their religion. Yeah, their religion. Just because they're Muslim, that gives you no right to treat them differently. We are all equal image bearers of God. All of us. We treat every person with dignity and respect. When I don't, I am unrighteous and not doing what is right. I am ignorant when it comes to righteousness and justice. They were ignorant in their injustice. He's accusing them of being ignorant of history, Bible history. Did you bring me sacrifices and offering for 40 years in the desert, O house of Israel? He's saying, back when I brought you out of Egyptian slavery and you wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, did you bring me sacrifices and offering all 40 years? He's rounding it off because by the time that they got this instruction, it was 38, but it's often referred to as the 40-year period. And he's saying, no, you did not. You set up a calf. Moses was up on the mountain, and you set up a calf and started worshiping that as if that were Jehovah. And he said, you worship an idol, a golden calf. And through the years, even though some of that was gone, you still worshiped idols. We do the same today. We even have a program on TV called the American Idol. We think these people are somehow better than the other. We want to be like them, have a voice like them. and We all have the things that we have as an idol that we worship. He says, don't be ignorant. Expose what it is. He says, listen, their idolatry said, you have lifted up the shrine of your king, the pedestal of your idols, the star of your gods, which you have made for yourself. Most believe that this is referring to Molech, because the Greek translation of the Old Testament seems to refer to a spe specific deity, and that this Molech was, was the god to which they would actually offer up their children and burn them, sacrifice them. America does this today. We offer up on the altar of our convenience, pre-born children through abortion, just like they did back then, to appease and gratify my own convenience. Whoa. Whoa. See why he said, whoa, whoa to the ignorant. He said, woe to the ignorant. Ignorant of there's consequences for your actions. Therefore, I will send into exile beyond Damascus. So there's Jerusalem or Israel, not Jerusalem, Samaria and Israel. There on that little tiny spot on the map. Beyond Damascus. So there's Damascus. Damascus is part of the, the Syrians. And he said, but I'm going to send you beyond that. And the way beyond that is the Assyrians. Not the Syrians, but the Assyrians. And he says, I'm going to send you there. Guess what? They'll never return. 
They're the 10 lost tribes of Israel. Israel in the north were carried away eventually. God says, therefore, I'm sending because all of your hypocrisy, you think that you're worshiping me and you are not. You're being carried away into captivity. Woe to the ignorant. He turns from talking about woe to this ignorance. Woe now to the complacent. Woe to you who are complacent in Zion. Zion would be like the area of Israel. And to those, uh, uh, to, <clears throat> and to you who feel secure on Mount Samaria. Now Samaria is where the capital of the northern kingdom was. And, and Samaria would be like Zion is America and Washington, D.C. is Samaria. He's saying, woe to you. Because you're complacent. You think everything is just okay. Isn't that the way our politicians are today? They have no fear of God. You notable men of the foremost nation, we are the number one nation on the planet, and do they acknowledge God? No, they manipulate. Try to get the Catholic vote, the evangelical vote, the Mormon vote, uh, uh, the atheist vote. Uh, you know, the Satanist vote. And they just manipulate to get the votes. To whom the people of Israel, they come to you for what leadership? But they are complacent. Complacent. We've had an arch enemy to our freedom, our liberty, and our capitalistic system for years. It's Marxism. It's been going on for years. Marxism has taken on different names through the ages. Uh, Marxism took on communism. It took on the term progressivism. And now it's critical theory, critical theories. And it is the same adversary, just dressed with different lipstick on the same old pig. That's all it is. And all of these systems, it's to divide the people and pit them against each other. In Marxism, it was simply to divide the people by class, the poor and the wealthy, the bourgeoisie, the wealthy, the proletariat, those on the bottom, pit them against each other and have a conflict. The problem arose that it didn't work is because there became a middle class. And the middle class, okay, that, that middle class foiled the whole thing. It wasn't two against each other. The lower class was able to work her way into middle class, and the middle class, it just didn't pit the two against each other. They were having the blessings of an upper class, and yet always pulling people up in the middle class, and it foiled the communism. Today it's back again, but now it's called, it's called racial critical thinking. And it's nothing more than the old, it's trying to get races divided and pitted against each other, but in the body of Christ, there is no difference. We're all image bearers of God, all of us. It doesn't matter what your gender is. It doesn't matter what your race is, this critical theory. And trying to pit one another against each other, the whole women's movement was to pit men against women. And now it's this race critical theory to pit one race against another. And so all of this is going on, going on. And it's complacency and corporations caving into it because we want you to buy our product. We think we can get more of you to buy our product if we do this or that. We become complacent and not defensive. Listen to what he says. Go to Kelna and look at it. So Kelna's way up there in the north. He says, uh, from there all the way down uh, to Hamath. And then go all the way down to Gath of the Philistines. The Philistines are in that area. Are those, are those locations any better off than you? You see, we always think the grass is greener on the other side. Don't we? Always thinking, oh, there's going to be something better. We need more socialism, or we need more, and you just name it in there. You just put it in You just throw that thing in there. And then we'll be so much better. He said, are they better off than your two kingdoms? I ask, is, is the socialist world better off than America? Have you ever looked at Russia or China or Venezuela or Cuba? 
Come on, are they better off than we are? And I know what you'll say, no! And that's exactly what he's telling them. Are they better off than your two kingdoms, Judah and Israel? Is their land larger than yours? Why would you want to live an idolatrous situation as they are living without the blessing of God? And why would we want to put our eyes on all these other nations that have failed at every turn? Why? Why? We get complacent. We don't get vocal. We don't make our, our voice heard. We don't write to the, the editor of the local newspaper or put a, on a blog. Uh, we don't write our congressman. We don't call our senator. We don't, we don't do the things that are in our power to actually change this. Some of you know that I'm a real Diet Coke fan. How many know that? How many know that? Well, I'm here to inform you, I gave up on Coke. Because Coke went woke. So some of you are thinking, you don't drink Diet Pop? Oh no, I went to Diet Pepsi. <laughs> Pepsi! I can't stand Pepsi. Well, after a week, I got to like it. You can Make your little voice heard. So I wrote Coke. I never write anybody. But I said, you know what? This is enough. It's enough. I wrote Coke. Of course, Coke didn't send me anything back. They didn't send me anything back. But they heard my voice. They heard my voice. Listen, we can do something. We can do something about the abortion issue. If it's just, I am never going to vote for an abortion pro-choice candidate again in my life. I'm going to do something. I'm going to do something. I can make my life count for righteousness. I don't have to be complacent. The next item he has here is woe to the indulgent. Indulgence and procrastination and putting off. See, some of you are thinking, yeah, I can do that. Oh, I can do this. You're thinking of things you can do, but... You put off the evil day and bring near a reign of terror. You put things off. You're indulgent and procrastinating. I'll do it later. I'll do it later. I'll eventually get around it, to it. My wife knows that I'm like that. We did some remodeling in the house in 2014, and she wanted a fan in the ceiling in the bedroom, and I did not. And so the box sat there, and she did not move it. She put things on it, but till the year... 2020. So for six years, that box sat there. And then I was asked to help somebody do something at their house, and I knew the ultimatum. I could not do help at somebody else's house until I fixed my own house. And so I put that fan in, and, and, and she said, so what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm putting a fan in. She said, no, no. Why are you doing this? What are, what are you really doing here? Well, I told someone so I'd fix their drywall, and, but I knew I had to fix my, my stuff here before I did theirs. I was procrastinating. And I was indulging because it was, it was, I didn't want that fan blowing out on me. I, 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 don't, I like it still. She likes the wind, and, and so now i got to cover up so I don't get the wind. And so... But we worked out the compromise. Woe to the indulgence of procrastinating, putting it off. Woe to the indulgence in luxury. He said, you lie on beds and laid with ivory and you lounge on couches. You dine on choice lambs and fatted calves. We are one of the wealthiest nations on the planet. We are indulgent in luxury, indulgent in entertainment. You strum away on your harps like David and you improvise musical instruments. Listen. You, you, you've got these entertainment everywhere you look. I don't know, between our cable and the streaming, we probably got a million different channels. And we still can't find anything to watch. <laughs> we are so indulgent. Sometimes it's too many choices. Sometimes it's just we can't find anything that strikes our fancy. Indulgent in excess, you drink wine by the bowlful and you use the finest lotions, but you do not grieve over the ruin of Joseph. Joseph is Israel here, the nation Israel. Um, we gloat over a rising stock market, don't we? The economy is good. 
but we don't lift a finger towards our national sins. That's exactly what was going on in Israel. Woe to the indulgent excesses. Then he says there's an indulgent consequences. Therefore, you will be among the first to go into exile, and your feasting and your lounging will end. Woe, woe, woe. He turns at this point and says, woe to the arrogance. Avoidance leads to arrogance. The sovereign Lord says, sworn by himself, the Lord God Almighty declares, I abhor your pride, the pride, your arrogance of Jacob, and I detest the fortresses. I will deliver up the city and everything in it. He says, there's arrogance to death. It leads to death. Ten men are left in one house, they too will die. And if a relative who is to be burned, the bodies comes to carry them out of the house and ask anyone still holding there or hiding there? Is anyone with you? So here's a picture. God is bringing judgment in the house. Ten people have died. A guy comes in and says, hey, is there anyone hiding in here? And this is what he says. Did you make it? Did you survive? And he says, no, there's no one who's still here. He says, hush, we must not mention the name of the Lord. Don't say the name of the Lord or more judgment will come down upon us. Whoa. This is, whoa, terrible times are coming to the nation of Israel. For the Lord has given the command and he will smash the great house into pieces and the small house into bits. God is going to judge and he's going to judge powerfully. Listen, do horses run on, on, on Rocky crags, no, they're very careful in their step. Does one plow there with oxen? No, you don't plow where all the rocks are. But you have turned justice into poison and the fruit of righteousness into bitterness. You are doing what is wrong and not what is right. That's what you're doing. You who rejoice in the conquest of low de beer, low de beer, well, low de bar, but low de beer. The name means no thing. We call that nothing. He says, you rejoice in nothing and say, did we not take Carnium uh, by our own strength? Oh, look at what we did. And he says, he say, he's mocking them. You've done this great thing, but God, it's nothing. What you've done is absolutely nothing. For the Lord God Almighty declares, I will stir up a nation against you, O house of Israel, that will oppress you all the way from Lebo Hamath to the valley of Arabah. He's saying, listen, your, your time is coming when the record is all going to be set straight. Whoa. What's the point of all this? Wow. The point of all this I find in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 30 and 31. For we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, just a couple of verses later in Deuteronomy 32, the Lord will judge his people. The Lord will judge his people. We will not be condemned and sent to hell, but we will be judged. That's what the judgment seat of Christ is about. You either receive a reward or you don't receive a reward, but a time is coming when you will give an account of what you have done with your life. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You know, one day, like Isaiah went into the, into the temple, and he saw the Lord, and he said, whoa. One day, we're going to stand before the Lord, and we're going to say, whoa. Whoa. What have I done? What have I done? So what's the point? Isaiah saw the Lord and said, woe is me. Amos heard the voice of the Lord and said to the people, woe to you. I haven't seen the Lord. I've read the word, so I've heard the word. I've heard the Lord. And I am a preacher. And like Amos, I say, woe to you. We will all give an account. We all give an account. So what's the point? Here's what I'm trying to get to. 
Don't be ignorant about biblical things. Get in the Word. Get into the Word. Get into the Word. Don't become complacent. Don't just say, well, I can't do anything and just go with the flow. Let your Christian voice be known. Let it be known. Don't be indulgent. Listen, don't become arrogant and proud and superior. Instead, be wise. Be wise. Get in the Word. Let the Word get into you and become wise because the Word will make you wise. Listen. Don't be complacent. Get concerned. Find a cause that God has put on your heart. Be concerned with a passion and do something to make a change. Don't become indulgent. Become moderate. You don't have to have excess. You can share what you've got. No, don't give it all away because then we're going to be needing to give to you. Just be moderate. Be moderate. Don't be arrogant. Be humble. Humble is just seeing yourself as you truly are, but preferring others as more important. It's not putting yourself down. That's a false humility. It's seeing yourself for exactly who you are, but preferring other people as more important. Arrogance is seeing yourself as bigger and better and greater than you are. Avoid that extreme. And avoid the extreme of putting yourself down. Just see who you are as God made you and prefer other people as more important. That's the whole point. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do know that a day is coming when we will stand in your presence to give an account of our whole life. And I am sure we will say, woe. In all your holiness, in knowing how sinful we have been, we will say, woe. And yet we know that something better than live burning coals purging our lips, the very blood of Jesus Christ has purged our hearts. And so at the same time, we'll say, praise the Lord, hallelujah, that you have saved me from my sin. Wow. We'd say, wow, not whoa. Lord, I just pray that if someone here today has never really placed such faith in Christ, that right now they would say, oh Lord, I'm a sinner. I deserve the judgment of God. But I realize Jesus took my place and paid it all. I don't have to be a child of the darkness. I can be a child of the light. Save me, Lord Jesus. Lord, we know such a prayer will be answered. You will change them from the inside out because that's the way you operate. Bless us now, Lord, as we close our service. In Jesus' name.